uh, and and your junior, you should be able to have an interactive experience with a, a co-pilot that could guide you through a process. Cool. So let's quickly um, go over these in detail and what I mean, what we mean by them, right? So complete analytics platform, everything should be unified. Um, you you shouldn't, you know, workloads, personas, everything should be unified, right? Everything should be working in the same environment. You shouldn't have to worry about integration or anything. It should just work out of the box, right? Um, we want to make sure it's it's also SaaS layer, right? So everything should be SaaSified. Um, you know, you shouldn't have to worry about any plumbing. Uh, it's literally just request access something, create something, it's just stood up. You shouldn't have to worry about it. And then um, secured and governed, which is key to us, um, is that, you know, you should have tenant level style policies that you should be able to build. You shouldn't, uh, if you're a, um, an analyst um, and you're consuming data and building data products, uh, you shouldn't have to worry about you know, am I compliant? You know, the, these are things that um, the organization should already have stood up for uh, as policies. So, you know, make sure you're not leaking information, leaking data, DLP policies stood up, right? Um, and they should just apply naturally. You shouldn't have to worry about it. Make sure that um, uh, data that you shouldn't have access to, that, you know, that's managed by policy. You, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't have to worry about these things. So you should just be able to consume and create and, and build. Right. And then when it comes to lake centric and open, um, that is obviously we have our one lake, so our SAS data lake, right? Uh, we have a couple of concepts here, such as one copy, um, which is uh, the idea that once you've curated a data artifact or a data product, you shouldn't have to duplicate this again. Um, it should just, you should just be able to um, to reconsume it in its already processed state, right? So minimize duplication of data uh, as we go along. And then um, the third thing here is about being open at every tier, and I've touched on this already. Um, you know, if, if you want to bring external compute, you should just be able to do so um, if you wanted to. So if you if if you got a service that want to consume this data that you that you produce, you should just be able to do so. Uh, and we should, no matter what the workload it is, we should always work with the same sort of open standard so that each workload can can work with each other, right? So then how does this look from an interface, right? So we have uh, currently uh, seven different personas. So we have our data factory, so our power plant manager integration pipeline integration layer, right? We have uh, Synapse data engineers. We have our, our Spock uh, data engineering clusters. We have our data science um, workloads that supports um, Synapse ML um, and you know, ML flow activities, those kind of things, your batch scoring in that. Um, we also have our data warehousing endpoint. Um, and then obviously we have real-time analytics Power BI and Data Activator, right? Um, so, as I said before, in the foundation, we have one lake, right? And because we have one lake uh, as the sort of single managed SaaS data lake, um, we have then all of these other layers we can put on top of it. So we have our, our one security motion, which is um, we have a single inception for data access or single sort of entry point, entry vector into one lake for data access. We have our universal compute capacities, which allows us to uh, to not you know, simplify the whole purchasing motion around, um, uh, uh, around the compute side. So um, you don't have to worry about, you know, if I buy this SKU, what do I need for my real time analytics? What do I need for my data factory? It's, you know, it can be shared across all workloads. And then obviously our shared workspaces um, that enable uh, you know, federated analytics and, and you know, being able to, um, to work across departments and cross organization or across the organizations and domains of the business. And then obviously our AI assistance that we provide um, for everything. 
Cool. So let's um, um, before I continue, I just want to say if if at any given point you have questions, um, you're more than welcome to to just go off mute and and ask them. Um, I cannot see the chat uh, if you're posting questions in the chat. Um, so um, maybe Jean, if you can moderate the chat as well, or at least let me know if there's questions coming. Cool. Right. Patterns and principles. So what are some of the underpinning like like what are the what are the the data patterns that really matter for Microsoft Fabric and to make it that we sort of built uh, the product around? So one of them is um, uh, shows up one of the most prominent patterns or industry standards that we uh, that we have adopted is um the data lake house pattern right um and what the reason we adopted it is because it is a fairly simple industry standard today when it comes to data engineering and when it comes to the analytics state and and how we see curation of data right so um in instead of having um what you know the the, the traditional sort of data lake architecture where you have multi zones and you've got cross zones and you got different sandpit zones uh, and it you know it, it becomes really difficult to manage we we sort of put our or built our our product or marks of fabric around uh, the lake house pattern so some of these benefits as we take the 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 goodness that um the data lake patterns had which is polyglot store um, you can work in multiple different data formats structured data unstructured data doesn't really matter right but it also brings that um, uh, the whole schema read kind of requirement to the mix too so once uh, once you go into curated and conform data um, you start getting like actual structured data in there right so table data uh, asset compliance with your delta tables that sort of thing um uh, other principles that are good uh, or, or that we found really good with the lake house pen was the whole thing around uh, consumption from uh, bi tools you know uh, being able to query across your your data and those kind of things so the the lake house pattern fits the fabric model right so that's why we adopted it um now one thing i want to stress Right, so the the lake house, the data lake house pattern is a good way of seeing a curation cycle. Right, so as you move from from layer, you know, bronze layer or your raw layer into uh, silver and gold, uh, all you're doing is you're curating, you you know, you you're building trust across this pattern. Right, um, and uh, also for for those that are um. For those that are uh, very evangelical around the lake house pattern, it's important to understand that this is a pattern. It, it is, um, it's not um, hard and fast and rules about how many layers do you have. Uh, it's just important that at least you understand that there is a curation cycle and it's, you know, what each layer have uh, or, or is built for, right? So, you know, bronze layer, this is our ingestion layer. Uh, we have data as is. Um, it's generally read-only um, stack. We we do no curation in there. All we do is we just ingest and manage data as it comes in, right? Uh, silver layer. Um, this is obviously for a standardization. So this is where we run light data quality actions such as deduplication. We do a little bit of extension of it so we understand um where the data is coming from we tagging source systems whatever logic we build in date stamp maybe light SED or merge operations um and sort of if we have a, a versioning uh, topology we need to respect and then gold layer is our final model layer where we have uh data ready or consumption grade um uh, data products built in or 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 data ready for uh, data products, um, and this is you know where you should be able to consume things. This is where you all have your uh, your data marts or your warehouses or your lake houses, depending on on, on what tech uh, you want to use. 
Um, but your know, gold layers generally like your con end user consumption layer, right? It still doesn't mean, um, and and if we if we put this in the context of um, uh, of a federated or as a domain based architecture uh, or or mode of operation, um, you can have a central domain, right? Central IT domain that is responsible for uh, all industrialized pipelines for your ERP system, uh, for your um, CRM environment, for your um, all your operational stacks um, and all of that in terms of data comes in, gets processed, standardized, and it has this regular rhythm um, and IT is then uh, responsible then to produce um, data products in your goal layer, right? Um, that might be one way of seeing it. And then gold, could then become the bronze layer of another business domain, right? So you might have, um, uh, I might need to pick up or consume um, data for that I can then build and augment with, or it becomes um, a bit of an augmentation of an existing gold product that you have building. So in Fabric, we've got this thing about shortcuts, right? Um, and in this case, you know, you might, uh, have a, uh, a, a lay cast that you stood up and you just shortcut it in uh, different uh, different data artifacts from different gold layers and combine them to make your, your own data product or your final data product and, and you know, purpose build thing for your domain, but you're still using someone else's gold layer. So that's a little bit about why we adopted lay cast pattern and sort of how that works. Now, another thing that's really important to think about is um, how we see data products. And just because um, you create a, a table, it uh, doesn't mean that you have a data model, right? So it, it, you, you, when we think about data products, it's generally like a collection of data artifacts to build up a data product. Now, there are really three main policies that we have to think about data products, right? And uh, the so the the first or three rules that we have to think about. So the first one that I always talk about is that data products must have an associated service level or um, or an OLA if it's the operational level agreement, right? And the reason why I say this is because if you're building a product, it has to be documented, right? It has to, you have to guarantee it. And that's why in the gold zone, that's where predominantly you should have your data, your data products should be published out of, so to speak, right? So, um, so a data product must have an own, must have a service level agreement where you commit um, as a, as a data owner uh, that this product is um, uh, you know, is uh, is serviceable and consumable. The second um, principle of policy around uh, data products that you should um, that you should probably adopt is the the principle that a data product can be derived from other data products. And I talked a little bit about this before with shortcuts in the previous slide, where um, you know. Let's say uh, the uh, marketing department have a uh, their customer 360 or their or their marketing feedback collateral, right? Um, that um, maybe the the re product research department wants to use, so they they could the product research department could then uh, use the marketing department's data and sort of build their own sort of product matching um, uh, products, for instance, right? Um, and they, by consuming, you know, published reliable gold data out of the marketing department. Okay, so it's a bit of a weird scenario, but or, or weird example, but, you know, this is sort of thinking about data products should only be produced or derived from, from uh, well, the data products can be derived from other data products, right? The third principle 
and I already touched a little bit on this, is that data products must only be published out of the gold zone. And this is, um, the, let's just say that, that this is a little bit about, a little bit like theology and religion. Uh, some, some, uh, some folk will disagree with me here and say, maybe I'll build data products out of silver uh, because that's what's valid for me. And I think that that would be a foolish thing to do, specifically because you're you're looking at the reason why you have um, or the principles around uh, the data lake house pattern is for curation and trust to be hired the further down the chain you are. And if you if you build data products only out of gold zone uh, related artifacts, um, then that means that you guarantee the highest level of trust in the products that you build, right? And you shouldn't mix and match these layers. Uh, it's also difficult to, um, it's also difficult if you're going to have many different policies or m many different operational procedures, should I say, or like principles uh, within the organization. If you've got a very federated uh, organization, if you, if, if you can agree on these rules up front, it means that the, the managing and the operating of this uh, of your architecture is going to be a lot easier. Cool. Um, I want to move on and I want to talk a little bit about the actual sort of data architecture, right? So when I talk about data architecture, we you know, I want to do this and say, um, you know. Here's a, an architecture diagram or our reference architecture for Synapse Analytics, uh, the last one we produced. Um, and, uh, you know, this sort of typical Lambda style pattern, it catered for everything from, you know, real time analytics to, you know, our pipelines, so typical data pipelines, right? We had our polyglot store, um, and then we had compute on the other side uh, with our dedicated pools and serverless SQL. Um, we had the ability to work with um, uh, stream analytics and streaming data. Um, you know, we had our data explorer workload for that too, uh, as well as we had, you know, AI capabilities as well around cognitive services and uh, uh, AML, right? Then we would serve up to different applications, be it visualization, business applications, uh, with our, our, our you know, cognitive search and all of those things, and we'll serve to the end user, right? If we take this and we move it to fabric, you know, this is what we would literally translate it to, right? Uh, it's still, um, it, it's still sort of the lambda style architecture, and depending, depending on, uh, on how you see lambda. Uh, architecture, if you if you think it's valid, you could probably also wrap this out around as a Kappa architecture. But um, if you just say that uh, the sort of the the streaming environment is, we don't care about the uh, you know if it's micro batch or if it's batch data, right? But we have we have the same capabilities as we had with Synapse Analytics. So we've got our data pipelines, our integration environment. Uh, that we use to ingest data, we store it in a um, typical, you know, in the file section of a of a lake house. Typically, um, we have also the ability to pull in, um, you know, streaming data using event streams or Spark streaming, if you wish, um, for data onboarding. Um, when it comes to the batch pattern, then we've got uh, our data engineering or Spark workloads that can then go in and. and and build out our uh, our silver data. Um, we've got our Custo clusters that can operate across this too. Um, and then uh, for our gold layer, we can either use Spark uh, or we can use the data warehouse endpoint and we can use the typical sort of DML actions. Um, we also cater for, um, uh, you know, our batch operations, our sort of, um, model scoring and ML flow um, capabilities. Um, we also have uh, some capabilities working with AR Studio, etc. 
Um, and we will obviously have uh, our OpenAI, uh, our Azure OpenAI capabilities as well that you can use to augment um, the sort of the Golden and the consumption data. Um, we also obviously cater for exploratory data science uh, using our Spark data science or our, our Synapse data science uh, clusters. Uh, and then underneath all of that, thus we, you know, manage the entire semaphore uh, operations using, uh, sorry, excuse me, uh, using uh, the, uh, the data factory um, kept pipelines to, to sit and trigger and work with. Um, and then obviously we have our data activator uh, capabilities as well. From a consumption layer perspective, um, we obviously have SQL endpoints. So if you have um, uh, if you have uh, applications that need uh, a SQL endpoint, or if you want to do ad hoc analytics, you can obviously connect to uh, to the gold layer um, directly using SQL. Um, be it Management Studio or inline in the application, uh, or if it's an external application that needs a SQL endpoint, uh, we provide that. Then obviously with Power BI, we provide um, our new uh, direct lake mode uh, for our semantic models as well that allows you to uh, consume or, or have the semantic layer uh, for you know, straight on top of your gold zone where you don't have to reprocess uh, you know, your data again loading it into an XML endpoint or a Power BI data, so, data set. Um, cool. Um, when it comes to more traditional, we have a, a second pattern that we support, um, which is an adaptation on the uh, modern data warehouse motion. So instead of having, uh, if, if you, um, if you're migrating um, an on-premises data warehouse and you don't want to rewrite the entire chain or there's a, a bit of a steeper learning curve and you're not familiar or comfortable using Spark, um, you can um, take this sort of scenario into consideration where uh, you have a, a, you know, you remove your silver layer, so to speak. So you have uh, a staging raw layer uh, in one leg that where you ingest your data, uh, you then um, typically copy into using SQL uh, into a staging schema in your in the main industrialized data warehouse. And then um, after that, you have DML jobs, like typical um, you know, store procedures that would then build out your, uh, your Different data marts and uh, you know, facts dimensions, those kind of things, data models, etc. And then from a consumption, uh, you would then stand up uh, lakehouse endpoints that just shortcut in to the industrialized artifacts of your main data warehouse, um, and that would then be your uh, your source for uh, you know your purpose-built sort of um, uh, data marts. Uh, for the different, you know, for different business units and or uh, business purposes. And this still supports the data, you know, the, the full data science side of the world as well. Uh, it's just that the, the pattern looks a little, little bit different, right? Cool. Um, any, at this point in time, uh, any que are there any questions? Anyone have anything they want to ask? So, so uh, there is one question. They said, is uh, the app in the data uh, learning zone, learning zone, referring to logic app? But uh, uh, what in the on, on the consumption? This one here. Yes, it could be related to this, but uh, I'm not it, sure. It's, yeah, so it's, it's if you have apps, if you build apps that relies on data, it's literally just the consumption. Um, so it's it's that you have apps that could be feeding. So it, yeah, it could be a power app. Uh, it could be a, a web app you built. It's it's all, it's just, a, um, it's just showing that we, you know, there's a forward processing part available for consumption for apps as well. Oh. 
Right, let's move to the next section. So um, with if we think about the whole one lake scenario, right? So the 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 one of our our main drivers, and we're doing this by introducing like the the domains as a concept within uh, Microsoft Fabric, and we're doing this on purpose. We we're thinking about federated analytics, and we're thinking about how uh, different business units can operate, uh, you know, on top of the same one lake data and still benefit from, uh, you know, you know, benefit from their own sort of, you know, oscillating their own sort of uh, domain style environment where uh, they would have their own workspaces. You know, so in this case, we have finance, we have marketing, they can still share data between them. They can still have, uh, you know, data contracts between them um, and they can still collaborate. Um, and you know, marketing can use finance data for research purposes, uh, and finance can use marketing data for, uh, you know, uh, at the same pace, right? So we're trying to create this environment that fosters federated analytics, and we're taking it even even further. So we even seeing, you know, one lake is this, uh, call it virtualized semantic layer, right? So. Um, you probably already know about uh, multi-cloud capabilities of shortcuts. So you could, um, you know, we're, we're comfortable working alongside your AWS S3 buckets and the data that you built there. Maybe you've been using SageMaker to build out a regression model and you want to consume this uh, and you want to surface it. Um, you can use one lake as a as a virtualization of that uh, data state so that the rest of the business um can can consume that data and and uh, use it uh you might have and this is something we announced um what is it now almost two months ago at the fabric community conference in vegas um so you might have on-premises dell emcs uh, and you could use our generic um uh, s3 connector to just shortcut to your on-premises data uh, removing integration uh, challenges, uh, you know, with data that might sit on prem, uh, and how you can get that. Um, and also, you might want to use our mirroring capabilities for Snowflake and and other um, other data warehouse products, right? It, but you know, so that you can just re-democratize. You don't have to rebuild and re-engineer. It's just we want to make it. One lake should be your your you know virtualized or your your virtualized semantic layer or your virtualized data access layer, right? This is no matter where you where you work, you should be able to uh, to access access data through one lake, right? That's that's our idea and vision for you, right? We're also comfortable, you know. We understand that. You know, not everyone wants to use Microsoft Fabric for uh, for maybe for the data engineering workloads, and we're happy to work alongside uh, other technologies. And we're fully compatible with Azure Databricks. Um, so, uh, if if you already have a matured data engineering pipeline of how you ingest, curate, and build data, you can. We're happy with that. Um, as long as using Delta tables. Um, we're all good. We shortcut that data in. We can load your your uh, Power BI models straight on top of that. Um, uh, as long as it's surfaced through one leg, it just gives you that one sort of single layer of pane of glass. Um, cool. Um, before I go into capacities, um, uh, are there any questions or can we quickly move on? Yes, uh, you have one question. There's one lake support all of the open source format. Hoodie, Delta, Lake, uh, and Asbeck. If so, how versatile is mix and match designing data pipeline? So um, technically, one lake is a polyglot, polyglot store and it doesn't really care. Um, or how you store data. So if if you want to, uh, the managed tables currently only supports Delta tables, right? So if you uh, if you think of the um, the and it's unfortunate we call it called lake houses, right? But uh, if you think of a lake house, which is a, 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 a call it a, a meta store, right? Um, 
it has two sections. It's got a file section um, for unstructured data or, or non-conformed data, should I say, right? Uh, so technically you can store whatever you want to store in there, uh, be it uh, Hoodie tables, iceberg, doesn't matter. Uh, CSV files, images, doesn't matter. Um, you, the uh, the Spark workloads, so obviously our, our, um, uh, our Spark clusters, um, they support, you know, you, you can run the, um, you know, you, at runtime you can do the pip install for, for Iceberg and go and grab that as a, um, as a library. Um, and then you'll be able to work with Iceberg tables, right? Same with the Hoodie in that. Um, we are, it, it's it's a kind of a bit of a roadmap question this like because some of this is are we planning do we have planned capability uh to handle um everything in the managed table section uh maybe um i would uh, i can't really you know confirm anything around that um there might be something in the roadmap um but yeah keep your eyes open cool uh, I, I take that answers that question um, right, let's talk a little bit about capacities and how you plan these. So um, obviously I said before we have universal compute um, or universal co compute capacities um, in our SKU. So we have like from F2 is our smallest SKU to our F2048, which is our largest SKU. And this is this, these capacities can be uh, consumed by all workloads, all serverless compute workloads, right? Um, it's there, there are a couple of things we got to just be cognizant about, right? So, whilst um, whilst we have universal compute, we have different way this compute operates or how it gets allocated, right? So we have two type of workload classes. We've got our our batch or background workloads, and then we have our interactive or foreground workloads, right? So if we look at the um at the batch workloads sorry it went the wrong direction sorry one second for me there we go so if we look at our background workloads right um we have a concept called bursting and smoothing right what what this effectively means is um we allow you to uh, run at a higher scale so burst out capacity right and then we smooth that out. We actually, uh, the, the capacity accounting is done over a longer period of time. So for background operations, this is 24 hours, right? So um, a typical example um, uh, or, or one reason, well, um, how you can see this is that um, for your batch workloads, you have a credit card, right? With X amount of compute associated or X amount of credits. Right, and you can every 24 hours, we will settle the outstanding balance of the credit card in full. Right, so if you today um, run run some run a, um, your your ETL pipelines or your data pipelines, right, um, and they would use consume your entire entire uh, capacity for the next 24 hours. We're gonna to try to run that as fast as possible. So, if if your batch batch uh, batch job needs, you know, re a lot more capacity than you have deployed, but you have that available over the next twenty four hours, we'll let you run at that at that hyperscale, um, um, you know, at the point of execution, uh, because we know that you know you next time you run, there's going to be in twenty four hours time. And you can you you have a lot of white space. We're just going to let you run this as fast as possible. Um, the uh, the other thing that you need to be cognizant about is that um, when it comes to the interactive workloads, this looks a little bit different, right? So the interactive workloads such as Power BI, so dashboards and reports. Uh, your embedded um, your embedded reports, your um, your exploratory data science. So when you got uh, your interactive 
uh, Spark sessions running, uh, or be it ad hoc SQL queries to the SQL endpoint, right? So someone runs a, a select statement or loads their uh, their Excel full of data, you know, using a, a, the SQL endpoint, uh, or if you're running a, a, like a KQL query or something like that, that is run out of uh, as an interactive workload. So instead of that 24 hour window, uh, of you know of, of bursting and smoothing, that shrinks now to five minutes. And you may say five minutes that doesn't sound like like a lot, but it's it's actually quite a lot. It's quite plenty. So um, imagine that that you have, um, and we're going to see this from a concurrency perspective. So let's say you have a, a report um, that a user runs. Um, in 10 seconds, right? That uh, that consumes um, a sixth of uh, of your capacity, right? So you run one report, and it it to to visualize this entire thing, and it's a bad performance, but it's just a, a an example that that is simple for me to explain. So let's say your your report runs in 10 seconds. Um, you then have the report and you can interact and work with it. If it consumes a sixth of all your capacity, right? That means that if you can then in a minute uh, run, or, or if you uh, if if you have this bursting and smoothing of five minutes, right? So ten seconds, uh, you can then have sixth of these. Um, sorry, six times five. So maths is really bad. You can have six times five is three hundred, right? So you can have, or oh, sorry, thirty. You can have thirty users running the same report, right, to serve up data, uh, and they can uh, you know, interact with this report um, and get what they needed out of it. Um, you know, out of that that same compute out of those five minutes. So effectively you can you can burst out that way. Um, the reality is not everyone will execute reports uh, or interactive workloads at the same exact second. So you probably get a bit of stagnation anyway. But it's it's something to take into consideration, right? So what are some of the uh, some of the downsides around bursting and smoothing? And the downside is that bursting and smoothing um, is shit, you know, happens across all workloads, whether they're being um, interactive or whether they're being background operations. So they, so uh, an ETL pipeline, background operation, or or, or a Spark job, uh, or a store procedure running some DML code in a data warehouse will impact capacity availability for the front and interactive workloads as well. So some of the um, the reason I bring this up is because we've seen some examples where customers um, have done things in the data, data engineering space. And the one that comes to mind is uh, one that um, had a, a, an F64 capacity and they've been running a trial. They, they, they had a, a matured Power BI environment. Um, they've been running a trial with uh, the data pipelines, right? The pipeline activities uh, to load uh, clickstream data from uh, from Adobe Click Clickstream. So uh, they get a, a set of session IDs in, and that becomes a recursive action to go out and grab all the detail around these session IDs. Now, um, in production, typically this was taking them about an hour to get through, um, and then. We uh, they got fabric. Um, they tested. Um, they ran some small scale testing, and it seemed to work fine. You know, batches of 100, all good. Someone from the data engineering team decided, okay, well, let's just enable the full uh, full production config. Um, and uh, what normally took, you know, the full production config went from 100 configs or 100. Um, uh, session IDs to go and grab run web calls for to 30,000. And 
you know, the entire data engineer team, just look at this. It took seven minutes to, to complete and everyone was uh, celebrating. It's like, this is the best thing ever. We scaled, it runs, it's so fast, all's good. And then two minutes later, um, the, they started getting calls from Power BI users that are wondering why they're getting errors thrown because, you know, they're basically getting, uh, you know, denied access, a, a hard sort of capping of resources. And the, this was basically they they consumed all the daily compute or the 24 hour window of compute. Um, it, you know, the power plants execute really fast and was really parallelized and, and consumed all data. However, um, none of the Power BI users could operate because they the data engineering team had just cons uh, consumed all the uh, all the data. So that's one thing that we've got to be cognizant about. Um, and the second thing is with that in mind, we need to have a way of, of um, isolating, you know, when you deploy capacity, you need to do it in such a way that you can isolate, you know, interactive batch real time uh, workloads. So that they you don't have this sort of effect, right? And then think about it from another aspect. If you're having um, a sand pit, right, or a, a you know, or this rogue data engineering workload, they could you know they could sink your entire ship. They could just lock up the business for the next 24 hours if need be, right? So, how do we solve that? Well, a simple way of doing this is to look at stand up capacities for like your your industrialized uh, workloads for your interactive workloads and also you know sand pits data science and that. so kind of try to isolate the different 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 workloads because they have different types of SLAs right and by doing this you ensure like in this example this modern data warehouse example where you have uh, your data warehouse processing, your batch processing that's isolated in its own capacity, and you size the right size it for for that. And then your uh, lake houses that you stood up for that are specific for your analytical models and for whatever use cases they have, um, they just shortcut the data from from the main data warehouse that's been processed, and you just consume it. That means that those lake houses, the capacity that they're assigned to is isolated. So all your interactive workloads are, you know, they're protected from your industrialized workload and your industrialized workloads protected for your, your ad hoc, um, you know, BI workloads. And then I have a third capacity here that's set up just for your sand pits, so your exploratory data science, but someone's going and exploring data in the lake, running their use cases, you know, or they're running model training, you know, uh, and they're scoring, you know, building out uh, regression models, training models. Uh, you know, you you might want to isolate that capacity too, uh, and it also gives you gives you the ability to scale different workloads. So, because obviously, um, you, you can't uh, if, if you need to scale uh, a capacity up. You you do this in in by doubling the capacity, right? So if you had one big capacity and let's say you have an f64 you go from an f64 to an f128 and the, the you know the price it's literally just doubling your cost for this whereas you might have um an f64 for your front end you have an f128 uh, for your uh for your data warehouse and then you know an f32 for your exploratory data science right um those those sort of splits means that if you have a, a challenge in the front end side, you can just scale the front end and you don't have to take your global capacity requirement into consideration. You just scale that F64 to an F128 for however long you need to run it for, and then you can scale it down again when you need. Um, and also it, it allows you to, to get a bit more granular control. Another way of looking at, um, at capacity is also, that you can split it uh, between different domains, right? So, so from a billing perspective, um, and in this case, you know, finance has got uh, a few workspaces and they have an F64 capacity, marketing has got an F128 because they're doing more crazy stuff. And then central IT has got this big chunky F256 uh, that, that they use, right? Um, and the, the beauty of this is that 
you always know what finance is going to get billed for. They have their own capacity, right? Um, and you always know what marketing is going to get billed for. So there's never, you know, whomever owns the invoice, there's the, there's no weird sort of cross charging. So this is another way of of splitting it up. And you, in this case as well, you know, you're isolating um, marketing's uh, uh, experiments, right? Um, uh, when when they're running. Uh, but yeah, uh, whatever they do. Uh, sorry, I'm not able Was to that... hear you. One second, I... I can hear you, so I'm gonna mute uh, that person. Feel free to thank carry you. on. Enjoy. Okay, thank, thank you. Uh, so, so this is a way of seeing capacity management as well, right? Um, and then, uh, yeah, it, it sort of makes laugh laugh a little bit easier cool so final slide key takeaways when it comes to capacities so workflows they should be isolated by their intent so batch interactive or real-time and real-time analytics because they have different service levels and you don't want them to interfere with each other you can also split by domains and this simplifies the the cost model and cross charging uh and uh yeah at the end, you know, capacity design, you know, should be the balance between, you know, capability, the cost, the workload, how you isolate, uh, and what what is practical for you as an organization. And those are my my final thoughts. Cool. Now, any any final questions? No. Uh, um. Uh, I see. There's a. Uh, okay. No. No. No questions. There's no more questions. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I am. Uh, uh, I'm done with my with my collateral. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, as uh, as you said earlier, Gene, uh, next week is Microsoft Build. There are definitely going to be some announcements coming out then that you might want to uh, want to watch. Um, uh, yeah, specifically when it comes to fabric and, and the capabilities we're bringing out. Cool. Outstanding. And by the way, that was uh, a great presentation. I learned a lot. Right. And uh, thanks to thank you to all attendees uh, and thank you, Andreas. Uh, we hope to have you next year. And, and don't forget to register for feature data driven. Microsoft built uh, pass and also ignite. We also have uh, live 365 e e e event, so feel free to register. And uh, all of them are hybrid. Yeah, and enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, okay, and see you next week, Andreas. We hope to have you next week, next year. <laughs> next year, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. I hey, Andreas. Going. Yes. Uh, can you hang in for a quick minute? Uh, I, I, unfortunately, I have a, a personal thing I need to attend to. Okay, no worries. Take care. Or else my son won't be happy.